This is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, committed to teaching, research, and professional training with degree programs in multiple locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Embassy Suites by Hilton Charleston, an all-suite hotel and conference center minutes from Yeager Airport and Capital Market. Reservations and brasserie dining information available at hilton.com. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Good evening from Charleston, I'm Bob Runner. Thanks for joining us for the legislature today. All session long, organizations from around the state set up displays in the Capitol Rotunda to advocate for their individual causes. Today, West Virginia's Girl Scouts brought much more than the tasty cookies to the legislature. The Girl Scouts from the Black Diamond Council hail from 48 West Virginia counties and are part of a four state group of Girl Scout troops. Since they were founded in 1912, Girl Scouting strive to teach its young members leadership skills and being productive citizens with a passion for ingenuity, both outdoors and indoors. Black Diamond Council CEO Beth Casey says the girls come to the Capitol for a twofold purpose. The first being to see the legislature in action. Part of being a Girl Scout is learning to advocate for yourself and using your voice to, you know, share your needs. Uh, the second thing is for the legislature to see the amazing things that our Girl Scouts have done. And here they've showcased some of the trips they've been on, things like robotic competitions and a lot of their community service projects. The American Civil Liberties Union of West Virginia at the Capitol today to lobby lawmakers, but also to educate the people on civil rights. The ACLU's Lobby Day brought advocates for criminal justice reform, LGBTQ rights, and faith organizing to the heart of the state's lawmaking process. Eli Baumwell is the interim executive director of ACLU West Virginia. He says it's important for his staff to make contact with legislators, but also to educate and engage the public on their own civil rights and liberties. Well, because we cover such a large range of issues, sometimes they get lost in the day-to-day -day new shuffle, but these are all really important issues. They affect basic civil rights and basic civil liberties, and we think it's very important that the public is educated about them. Bombwell says the ACLU would like to see voting rights expanded to people on probation and parole this session, and will be following issues of capital punishment closely. West Virginia University men's basketball coach Bob Huggins honored by the legislature today as well. The Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame coach congratulated with citations read in both the House and Senate chambers. Huggins played for the Mountaineers back in the 1970s and has coached his alma mater since 2007. Over his 41 seasons, he's coached more than 1,300 career games, had more than 800 victories, and is the second winning active Division I coach right behind Jim Beheim of Syracuse. Huggins has notched more than 300 career victories with the Mountaineer squad, second all-time to Coach Gail Catlett's 430. Congratulations, Huggy Bear. As the legislature settles into the business of lawmaking, committees represent a crucial step in the process. It's where legislators can study and discuss a bill in depth before returning it to the floor. Reporter Chris Schultz was at this Tuesday's Education Senate Committee and spoke with Chairwoman Senator Amy Grady afterwards. Senators gathered in the Senate Finance Committee meeting room to discuss two bills Tuesday morning. Senate Bill 187 creates a new criminal offense of sexual contact, intrusion, or abuse of students by school employees, regardless of the student's age. Senator Charles Clements of Wetzel is the Vice Chair of Senate Education and the lead sponsor of the bill. He said he was inspired by an incident in his home county where school employees were involved with 18-year-old students, but no crime was committed due to the student's age. 
He said people in positions of trust must face consequences for abusing that trust. Senate Bill 124 authorizes the State Board of Education to create a child sexual abuse and sexual violence prevention program and in-service training in child sexual abuse prevention. Senator Amy Grady of Mason is the Senate Education Committee chair. She says although such incidents aren't common in schools, it is important for students to be aware that something wrong is happening. But unfortunately, we've all seen cases where they do, so and, and at home. And uh, making sure those kids understand what's happening to them and understand resources they, they can have and people that they have that they can go to if something that maybe they don't realize is wrong, because a lot of times these predators will, will train these kids to realize, think this is normal. Grady is a fourth grade teacher and as such is the first full-time public school educator to serve as chairman of the Senate Education Committee since 1970. I'm in the trenches, so to speak. My experiences as a classroom teacher are really, really important. And um, it's really hard to work on something in public education if you've never really been on the other side of it. So it gives me a unique perspective that I'm really excited about putting to work to make sure that we can make some positive changes. Grady says she has a lot of priorities for the Education Committee this session, but tries to take time to meet with other teachers and administrators. She says she meets every week with Superintendent David Roach to ensure the legislature and Department of Education are working in tandem. So we have to work together to make sure we're on the same page. And I think that's really, really important. Um, but the number one focus being student success. Every single thing that I focus on in my committee is focused around the students. And does this help our students in any way? And that should be the main focus of everybody. Grady says she and the superintendent have already worked together on their shared priority of early childhood literacy and numeracy. Another concern for the chairwoman is teacher pay. She says she's seen firsthand the competition from border states with higher pay for existing teachers. But attracting new teachers is also a concern. For the legislature today, I'm Chris Schultz. Yesterday, we covered a number of legislative issues with Senate President Craig Blair. Tonight, we move to the House of Delegates as government reporter Randy Yowie sits down with House Speaker Roger Hanshaw, Republican of Clay County, with his take on the progress and problems in these early legislative general session days. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Speaker Hanshaw, welcome, and uh, we're glad you're here on the legislature today. I'm going to call you Roger, if you don't mind. I don't. Because we've done that before. I don't mind at all. All right, I appreciate that. Let's start out with one that's close to your heart, early childhood education. It is. It seems like everybody is on the same sheet of music right now. We saw where uh, Superintendent Roach had come out with his plan for the first, second, third, and fourth grade. I know that you've had a plan for first and second grade teacher's aides. Then the governor in the state of the state says, let's put $37 million into first grade teacher aides. Tell me why that's so important, not just for those grades, but for the entire West Virginia education system. Yeah, it is. I'm happy to talk about that because earlier this fall we saw some numbers on, on, yeah. on performance scores from our public education students that really should, should give all of us a moment of pause, Randy. I, I, I think that if coronavirus has taught us anything over the course of the past couple of years, it is that remote education is tough and distance learning is difficult under even the best of circumstances. So one of the things that we know from the data is that teaching students how to read by the time they finish the third grade is really, really a, a sweet spot. That if we, don't, if we don't help students learn to read at grade level by the time they reach the third grade, the likelihood of them ever reading at grade level in their lifetimes is a single digit number, is, is, is very small and falls off pre precipitously even after that. So we really have an opportunity here with the surpluses that we're seeing in terms of the budget now, and the influx of federal money that our, our counties and boards of education as well as the state have received to make a meaningful impact on not just public education in, in the first, second, and third grade, but really in the whole, the whole continuum of K through 12 education. Because get, getting students up to grade level early helps them be successful the whole rest of their time in, in, the, in the school system and, and in life. And you're a data-driven guy and the data really shows that in first, second, and third grade, an impetus there makes a whole difference for kids that get into high school and want to go on to secondary it, it really does and you're right I do like I like making decisions based on numbers I like making decisions based on data and that's that's what the numbers show the numbers tell us that we need to get it done and we need to get it done by the third grade let's jump around a little bit let's talk about economic development and specifically 
site preparation. Now, we saw that the, many of the 29 companies that came into West Virginia last year are non-fossil based, are mm -hmm. renewable energy based. Mm -hmm. and, and we, you and I have talked before that this is a whole new era for West Virginia. And maybe that's not even a new era anymore. Now it's our era. Uh, I don't think we can take new off of that, perhaps. But we've talked about not laying a flat piece of land out anymore and saying, okay, this is ready for economic development. What are some of the specifics now that we need to do for site preparation? And is there any legislation that goes into that? Yeah, it doesn't just stop with a flat piece of property anymore, Randy. You're right about that, even though that continues to be a, a bottleneck for us. And we still, <laughs> have to, we still have to continue putting money into making sure that we're, we're we're ready when a company wants to come here and, and build a facility, but it's no longer just about having that flat piece of property. Now it's about having adequate transportation and, and, and transportation corridors to that site. It's about having uh, transmission and distribution electricity delivered to that site. It's about having natural gas ready at that site. And, and even at, to peel back the onion one layer further, it's, it's perhaps not just enough to say we have electricity at that site, it's do we have the kind of electricity at that site that the customer wants to buy. So you, you mentioned some of those non-fossil generating assets that are beginning to pop up around West Virginia. Where, where we are today, Randy, is where I think we have been as, as long as we have been a state, and that is that we want to produce the energy that powers the world. We want to produce the energy that powers manufacturing, that powers the service industry, that, pow that powers the world. And for, for, for two centuries, the energy that powered the world was our fossil fuel industry here in West Virginia. It's still powering much of the world. And as long as it powers the world, we want to be a player in that game. But we also want to be producing energy from every source that customers want to buy. And as long as customers are looking to buy energy from non-carbon sources, then we want to produce it. If they want to buy cheap energy, at, 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 at prices that are only competitive right now from fossil sources, then we want to produce that. We, we want to be in the energy game in every way that you can take that statement. Now, we're still producing coal, but there's a lot of coal communities in southern West Virginia that don't have that economy, don't have that severance money that they had before. Drastic, drastic cut. A couple of years ago, you organized a committee of delegates. You sent them down to meet in a number of different coal communities to find out what they needed to do to revitalize their non-coal-based economy anymore. And out of that came the Coalfield Communities Grant Facilitation Committee. It sure did. It passed the House, it passed the Senate, mm -hmm. the governor signed off on it. It was to supply tough to get matching grant money, I want to read this, and help write, facilita and write and facilitate federal grants, which isn't easy for mm -hmm. some local That's mayor exactly to do. That's exactly right. But now, there's not been a commission formed, there's not been any funding, you've disbanded your committee, some people down there in the coal fields, the mayors and, and, and councilmen and, and commissioners are going, what happened? Oh, the funding has been allocated. In fact, we've got people who are applying to it. We, we, have, we, have, local, we have localities that are applying right now for that matching money. So, so there's a commission that's, that there is a commission formed? The actual commissioners are, are to be named by the governor, so okay. not to be named by the legislature. And I knew that hadn't happened. Uh, it hasn't, although I did speak to the governor's uh, staff about naming the commissioners in that just this morning. So they're, they're, they're sending, I expect them to have up names this week. Just for this morning. For Senate confirmation, we did. We talked, so there are representatives on that. There are two from higher education, two from private foundations, right. four, I believe it's four from the public at large, one from a county government, one from a large municipality, one from a small municipality, and then the chair is the Secretary of Economic Development. But the cart's before the horse. There is some funding being... Doled out. Oh, there absolutely is money that's been doled okay. out. There has. So what we want, we want to see that happen too, because there's there's there hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funding that's floating around out here in small communities. And writing a federal grant's a big deal. Writing a federal grant is a is a difficult thing to do, and making sure that you've met the matching requirements, that you've you've met the the reporting requirements that you don't end up having to pay some of that money back is is a problem. You want to make sure that it's that it's done correctly. So I expect we'll even put more money in that program this year. That's great. I know they expected a quarter billion dollars just to be seeded into it at first, and, and that, that was going to help out a lot of communities. So that's really good news that that today that that's happening. I've been riding that one for a while. Yeah, as we, you know. we we have we have the the municipalities around the state, the county governments around the state, and the boards of education are. 
actively applying and receiving funding right now. It's good to hear. I'll call a couple of my mayor friends and tell them that. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about forestry, and I know that you had an idea of wanting to upgrade our forestry industry, and especially in furniture making, get competitive. Talk to me about that. Yeah, it is. One of the things that we're interested in doing is making sure that we're, we're taking down as many barriers to industries, Randy, as we can around the state. We're, we're one of the most forested states in America, always have been. I, I, saw a, I saw a piece of data not long ago in, in, in an article I read that shows that we're actually more forested now than maybe we've ever been as a state, that, that parts of, the, of the, the state have been forced to back over that, that maybe we're in, in uh, low productivity agriculture 100 years ago. So with that should come a manufacturing base and it should come a manufacturing industry, particularly in, in furniture. We had, a his, we had a, a, a historical role in furniture manufacturing for, for a century, but it, right? it, it, it moved offshore. I mean, there were, there were, small, there were fall, small furniture manufacturing facilities all over the state. They've gone offshore. They've gone, the ones that have, have not gone offshore have gone to places like North Carolina, That's where to Mississippi, to Alabama. We, we we, we've been studying that issue. We've been meeting with the forestry industry over the, the, the summer and fall, and they've identified for us some things that they think might make them more competitive here in West Virginia. So we, uh, we expect to, to give that some additional scrutiny here during this session. Great. Another horn that you've blown quite a bit is, is rare earth mineral, mineral extraction. And I won't say that 10 times. <laughs> um, I know that we had one business come in mm -hmm. over the last year that, that specializes in that. But this is are things that are made over in China right now that could be made here. They 100% could be. Uh, this is simple stuff that I guess we can get out of the ground and, and put to use. It is. So the thing about rare earth, what we call rare earth elements, Randy, is that they aren't actually all that rare. They're just, they're just in trace quantities. And you, you have to do a lot of work to get those trace quantities of rare earth elements refined into sufficient quantity to be able to use them. Well, one of the, one of the most prolific sources of all that material turns out to be coal. Turns out to be coal. And in specific, it turns out to be coal waste. So all right. the, all the, 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 we used to call it gob when I was a kid, all, the, all those refuse piles all over, all over West Virginia that have been a liability for for a hundred years, literally a hundred years, could now be under the right uh, technology platform, a treasure trove of things that we're buying now from countries that may not like us very much. So I'm excited about that. So West Virginia University is doing some tremendous research in this area. Uh, I think the next step, as I understand the technology transfer process right now, is that they're looking to develop the first pilot scale plant to actually deploy that technology at scale to refine rare earth elements out of that coal waste. That's a third word I've heard now for big industry is pilot programs in West Virginia. That's a good thing to hear, isn't it? It is a good thing, and, and it's, not just for, it's not just for big industry either. Right. I mean, these things could and, could and arguably should be located in parts of West Virginia where any industry would be welcome. And I, and I know that there's a lot of times that people have been saying that, that Republicans are all for big industry and the Democrats are still fighting for the small business. That's not the case, is it? Well, we're fighting for every business. I mean, I want every business that we can, that we can get here to West Virginia to come here. That doesn't just mean uh, a manufacturing plant of a thousand people. I have, I have literally gone to cut the ribbon at new employers in my district that's hiring three or four people. And if, if given the choice, if given the choice between one employer of 100 people or 100 employers adding one new employee, I'm going to take the latter because they're less, they're, they're less subject to one, one moment of closure and losing an entire industry. So our, our small business has always been the backbone of our economy. We talk most of the time about the large employers who make headlines and make announcements, and we'll always do that, and we're gonna keep doing that, and I'm very proud that we've gotten some of those announcements, but the heart of our economy has always been entrepreneurs. And I know when we're talking about entrepreneurs and small businesses, we're talking about skilled trades. And we had been talking earlier about taking some of these people that, that learn these skilled trades um, and getting them an associate's degree. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've looked at a program in Indiana that we might want to institute here. We sure have. We sure have. In fact, our Committee on Workforce Development, I'm expecting, ready to take that bill up this week. So they, they, I, I do expect them to advance a bill that would, would do exactly what you said. If you, if you complete a skilled trade apprenticeship program through one of our trade union organizations here in West Virginia, and if they've, if they've taken advantage of the program that we'll enact hopefully this week, they'll be granted a degree from a community college. What kind of feather in your cap does that give you, if you will? 
it's a huge one because one of the most problematic statistics that we see about West Virginia in the national rankings is our post-secondary educational attainment rate. So we're often ranked very near or even at the bottom of states in terms of men and women who have achieved some kind of training beyond high school. But what that data does not capture and what I've always believed to be a problem is those West Virginians who've gone and gotten uh, and achieved a skill, who have, who have maybe didn't earn a college degree per se, but they have a marketable skill that's very in demand right now. Many other states are capturing that in the form of associate degree programs that they've developed in collaborations between their community colleges and their trade organizations. We're going to do the same thing here. My wife, I was talking to my wife about that, and she's a native West Virginian. She has two associate's degrees. She's been working in a lab at, at a major hospital here for the last 35 years. She said, will that really help somebody career advancement? She, did, she, she wasn't sure that it really would. What do you think? Oh, I, I don't know. I think it's going to be different for every person. What I, what I know it will help, though, Randy, is our, our state level across the board attainment for education. So what the, what the benefit will be at the level of each individual, I don't know. That's the, each individual will have to decide for themselves, is this, is, do, do I perceive a situation later in life in which uh, after I have, have completed a, a, a career or part of a career as uh, pick any skilled trade, maybe they want to go back for a business degree. Maybe they want to start their own business. Uh, now they'll, now teach, they'll correct, or teach, now they would be they would be in a better position to go convert that perhaps say into a four-year business management degree or I, I, I told her I never thought it hurt to have a sheepskin attached to whatever you know how to do I think that's right I think that's it's as simple as that um, tax reform See, I, I, I didn't get the big one at first yeah we, yeah we went through some of the things that we care about that I know you care about mm -hmm. if you will um, but you talked a couple of weeks ago and you said that any tax reform that's going to come in is Going to, has to be impactful, and, and you were strong on that. We word. think so. Now, do you believe that this 50 percent that the House is looking at, that the governor proposed, that incrementally in, is that going to be impactful for the people of West Virginia? Well, again, it's what the data tells us, Randy. So we we want to make that decision based on what data tells us, and data tells us that if we if we make a 10 percent or 15 percent adjustment in our state income tax brackets, or or, or an overall reduction in 10 or 15 percent, that that would be that would be a nice thing for people but not, not, a, not a step that would move the economy. So what the researchers tell us is that, that a, a reduction of 50% or greater then actually begins to drive behavioral change. So as opposed to just simply putting money back in people's pockets, we also want to drive behavioral change. And what we, what we specifically mean by that is recruit people to move to the state. So when we say, beha when we say drive behavioral change, what we mean is move here. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we we the, we don't think we know the data. The data tells us that the business equipment and inventory tax scores at a point that would have driven behavior, and a decrease in personal income tax at 50 or greater percent in the aggregate drives behavior. So we think so. Do you think that? If, I've heard a lot of Republicans say that Amendment Two didn't pass because it was grouped together with the other three and it was people didn't have enough time to specifically research it. Is that something that we might revisit? Well, I think there was great confusion about all four amendments, Randy. So whether, whether I, I certainly wouldn't describe motive to the voters on why any of the four didn't pass, but I do think because we had four of them that it became very confusing for the voters. So I, I, know, I know I learned a lesson on that, that if it's up to me again, I personally wouldn't put more than one on a ballot again for the voters to consider so they can focus in on it and get all the education that they need or want. Uh, will, would we revisit it again? I guess it depends on what happens with tax reform here this week. So if we, uh, if we do move forward on a 50% reduction in personal income tax, that comes at a price tag, and that price tag is significant. So uh, we, we were planning to pay for all the proposals to eliminate the personal property tax on business equipment inventory in a certain way, and whether that is still available if we do a personal income tax reduction, I don't know. What's your perception on how the Senate is going to receive the 50% personal income tax that well, you so guys are about to pass? Yeah, we, we've talked about that. I mean, we, we meet nearly every day, and we've had that conversation, and the, the, 
the, the motivation, I think, is shared between our colleagues in the Senate and, and the governor's office, and that is that, that whatever it is we do, it has to be impactful, and it has to drive behavioral change. So we don't want to, we don't want to, we collectively don't want to do anything that just fritters away money. If we're going to do it, we want to do it big enough and bold enough to drive behavior. We've got less than a minute left. How do you feel things are going so far? I know we're only five, six days in, uh, and there was talk that this was going to be a lot of contention. How do you feel things are going so far with the session? It's seven days, but who counts? <laughs> um, uh, it, it's it's a it's a good time of the it's always a good time of year. So there's always there's always some some angst going into a legislative session. This year's been no different. But they're they're big ideas. People are introducing good bills. So overall, I'm optimistic. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. I know we covered a lot of topics. Okay. I appreciate your insight. Uh, thanks very much to Speaker Hanshaw for being here on the legislature today. Back to you, Bob. Thanks for that, Randy. That brings day seven of the 60-day legislative session to a close. Tune in to the legislature today, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. We'll have a lot more news and interviews from the 2023 legislative session. And remember, West Virginia's public broadcasting is covering the session daily in our radio news program, West Virginia Morning, and on our news site at wvpublic.org. We also broadcast the daily four sessions of both the House and Senate on the West Virginia channel, and we stream those on YouTube as well. I'm Bob Brunner. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, committed to teaching, research, and professional training with degree programs in multiple locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Embassy Suites by Hilton Charleston, an all-suite hotel and conference center minutes from Yeager Airport and Capital Market. Reservations and brasserie dining information available at hilton.com. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com.